Hi, my name is Nikon Baffa, and today I'll be presenting the paper Average Case Hardness of NP and pH from Worst Case Fine Grained Assumptions. And this is joint work with Li Jiu Chen and Shuichi Hirahara. So we're all familiar with the P versus NP question, and but how does this relate to cryptography? So if P equals NP, we get many fast algorithms for many hard problems. We get fast algorithms for the traveling salesman problem, for Boolean satisfiability, or you know your pick your favorite NP complete problem. But on the other hand, if P equals NP, then there's no cryptography. You can invert any potential one-way function, and so there's no private key cryptography, let alone public key cryptography. Okay, on the other side, if P does not equal NP, you know, we have no worst case polynomial time algorithm for whatever your favorite NP complete problem is. But what does it say about cryptography? Or even about average case hardness at all? And the answer is, we don't really know. It still remains an open question. And to more uh, precisely try to address the possible realities we live in, or possible worlds we live in, and probably also devised the five possible worlds that we could live in, um, relating to complexity theory and cryptography. And so one of the worlds is algorithmica, where P equals NP, or some equivalent of this. Heuristica is the world where P does not equal NP, so NP is hard in the worst case, yet NP is easy on average. And I'll define later what I mean by that. There's also the world Pessiland, in which NP is hard on average, yet even still, there are no one-way functions. And then you can also define worlds Minicrypt and Cryptomania, which are various worlds in which cryptography exists. And so one of the main open central questions in complexity theory, and also cryptography, is to answer the question of which world do we live in? And currently, we could live in any of these five possible worlds as far as we know. Okay, so one chain of implications is immediate. So if there's public key cryptography, there are one-way functions. And if there are one-way functions, then NP must be hard on average. And if NP is hard on average, it must be true that P does not equal NP. The other direction, though, remains unknown. So we don't know if P not equaling NP, for example, means if NP is hard on average. And furthermore, if we did have this second yellow arrow, that's, that has a question mark, if that were true, then that means P doesn't equal NP if and only if NP is hard on average, which means that heuristica cannot exist because NP cannot be simultaneously easy on average, yet hard in the worst case, if this yellow implication were to hold. So any of these yellow implications corresponds to eliminating a possible world that we live in. Unfortunately, there are many barriers in the way of trying to prove these yellow implications. And I'm not going to get into all of them, but just for this, uh, you know, heuristica to Pessiland implication, we have a black box barrier, we have a hardness amplification and possibility barrier, and we have a relativization barrier. And so any proof that shows that NP is hard on average if P doesn't equal NP has to simultaneously overcome all of these possible barriers. Okay, so let's give a little bit of background and complexity just to solidify notation. So P will be the usual polynomial time, NP will be non-deterministic polynomial time. UP, standing for unambiguous polynomial time, will have the same definition as NP, except that all inputs have at most one witness. So in NP, yes instances are allowed to have arbitrarily many witnesses, as long as it's at least one, and no instances have zero witnesses. But for UP, Yes, instances have to have exactly one witness, and no instances have to have exactly zero witnesses. We can define sigma 2p and pi 2p in the standard way. So sigma 2p is the class np, where you're also given an oracle to np. And pi 2p is a set of all complements of those languages. And we can define the polynomial hierarchy to be, in some sense, the limit of um, np to the np to the np and so on to be the polynomial hierarchy. Now I'll define some average case complexity notions. So by average P, 
I'm going to refer to the set of all, all pairs of languages L and distributions D for which there is an algorithm that is always correct and moreover the expected runtime over inputs x as distributed to distribution d is polynomial. And one thing I really want to emphasize here is that the distribution that we're considering when I say expected polynomial time is over inputs according to some distribution d. So it's not the case that the polynomial time, the expected polynomial time is with respect to internal randomness, but rather it's over the inputs x. And great. And before I go on, I should mention that there are also other notions of average p, which are one-sided error and two-sided error. And in fact, almost everything I say today is also going to apply to a one-sided error notion of average p. But just for simplicity, I'm going to phrase it as average p. And we can also define a distributional curly C, where curly C is some complexity class, to be the set of all languages L, where L is in this complexity class, along with distributions D, where D is polynomial time stampable. And once again, for this talk, it'll turn out that D will either be the uniform distribution, or it will be the unary distribution, where all the math is just on one string, say like one to the n, or it will be some sort of hybrid of these two distributions in, in some sense. Um, but just for simplicity, I'm going to phrase it as distributional C. So recently, Hirahara has made some wonderful progress towards potentially eliminating heuristica as a possible world we live in, where heuristica, as a reminder, is a world in which NP is hard on average, yet um, easy in the, or sorry, excuse me, NP is hard in the worst case, yet easy on average. So we showed explicitly that UP, as we defined on the previous slide, where all, wit all strings have at most one witness, if UP is hard, if it requires 2 to the O of n over log n time, or more than that, then this means that NP must be hard on average. Or in other words, that distributional NP is not contained in average P. Moreover, he showed the same thing for the polynomial hierarchy in some sense. And also for NP instead of UP, but where now he showed that NP does not have P-computable average case polynomial time algorithms, whereby P-computable, I just mean that given an input, you can efficiently estimate the runtime of your heuristic algorithm on this input without having to run it, which could potentially take exponential time. And this, this result, it turns out, also had some barriers like we discussed. It had to overcome a black box barrier, a hardness amplification and possibility barrier, yet it wasn't clear if it had to go through a relativization barrier. And you know, one can ask, can you do better than this two to the O of n over log n? Uh, worst case complexity assumption. In other words, can you maybe go to 2 to the little o of n over log n? And it turns out that this question would have to overcome a new relativization barrier as found by Hirohara and Nanoshima. So if you were to try to improve these results, you'd have to go over a new relativization barrier. And uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that these results just fall short of the exponential time hypothesis. As a very quick recap, the exponential time hypothesis is an assumption that says, you know, a 3CNF formula with m variables requires time 2 to the omega of m to solve. So, you know, requires exponential in m, the number of variables, uh, time to solve. And so if you write that out in terms of the length of the full instance, you know, n is the length of the full instance, and m is the number of variables, this corresponds to an assumption like 2 to the little o of n over log n. As we saw here, that has a relativization barrier that's new right at that running time. So you can ask, you know, is there any way to get average case hardness from ETH and not these stronger worst case complexity assumptions? You know, can we do better? And in fact, even SETH is too weak to imply the non-trivial average case hardness from those uh, theorem statements directly. So you can ask, what is the weakest worst case complexity assumption that gives you non-trivial 
average case hardness or some interesting statement about average case hardness from a hopefully weaker worst case complexity assumption. And the answer is that you can get away with uh, average case hardness or non-trivial average case hardness from ETH and even much weaker, in some sense, worst case assumptions. Just to spell it out a little bit more concretely, we show that if UP requires time two to the O of root n log n, or requires more time than that. So here we it's not O of n over log n, but rather two to the O of root n log n. Then we get that the non-deterministic linear time can't be solved on average in quasi-linear time. So here we have a much more fine-grained sort of average case hardness results, but it's still non-trivial. We still get some non-trivial average case hardness from a weaker, a much weaker worst case complexity assumption. Our second result is sort of the extension of this to the polynomial hierarchy. And there's something I really want to stress here, which is that in Pagliazzo phrase is an open question, can we get average case hardness of NP from average case hardness of the polynomial hierarchy? As an open question, and it remains open today. And you can even ask uh, the simpler question of, can you get average case hardness of sigma k plus 1p, or, or rather, can you get average case hardness of sigma kp from average case hardness of sigma k plus 1p? And here we show that you can get average case hardness of sigma 2p from average case hardness of sigma kp for any k. And in fact, not only average case hardness, but from worst case hardness of sigma kp for any k, we get average case hardness of sigma 2p. So this sort of result gives some sort of partial answer to Impagliazzo's open question, as well as uh, relates goes all the way to worst case complexity assumptions, giving you your average case hardness in the polynomial hierarchy. And lastly, just related to ETH directly, uh, ETH is an assumption that says that uh, non-deterministic linear time can't be solved on average in time n to the 1 plus epsilon for some epsilon, where furthermore we require that the runtimes effectively can be estimated in also n to the 1 plus epsilon time. Another way to interpret our results is through fine-grained complexity. So one can ask whether fine-grained cryptography exists and by fine-grained cryptography, I mean cryptography where adversaries are given slightly more time than honest parties. You know, you can ask about fine-grained one-way functions, which have been explored. And in fact, it's been known that fine-grained average case hardness of 0k clique and also or of k sum imply the existence of fine-grained public crypto. So in the fine-grained wor fine world, we have a transformation from average case hardness of these particular problems to public key cryptography. And you know, similarly, can we try to eliminate a fine-grained version of heuristica? And what do I mean by fine-grained heuristica? Well, I'll give one definition of the five-grained possible five worlds. Where here, when I'm talking about cryptography, um, I really mean adversaries that run in quasi-linear time in N. So n times polylogarithmic in n uh, time. And with this definition, you can define algorithmica, heuristica, etc. In, in a similar way. And as before, we have uh, trivial implications upwards. We have unknown implications downwards, each of which corresponds to eliminating a possible fine-grained five world. And our work can be viewed as an implication saying if up has some worst case complexity assumption that it, it requires more than time two to the O of root n log n. Then we get that non-deterministic linear time is hard on average in the sense that it can't be solved in quasi-linear time on average. So before diving into the technical pieces, let me give some meta complexity background that will be useful. So we will be using the notion of time bounded Kolmogorov complexity. So let some string x be have length n. We'll define the time bounded Kolmogorov complexity of x, this kt of x, to be the length of the shortest program pi, where if you were to just run pi on its own, 
it would output x in time at most t. So you can think of kt of x to be a compression quantity. How much can you compress x such that the time to decompress to get you back to x takes time at most t? That's one way to interpret this quantity. And just some quick facts. For sufficiently large values of t, uh, kt of x is going to be at most n plus, plus big O of 1 because there's a program that's just, you know, prints the following string, x. And the length of that program will be n plus a little bit just for the, for the you know, wraparound. Another fact is that this bound, for most strings, this bound is actually almost tight. And this fact comes just from the fact that there can't be too many programs uh, that, are, that are short, just by counting. And you can also have a generalization of this, where your program pi now also has access to an oracle A when you try to decompress to get you back to x. One notion that we'll use centrally from here on out is the notion of time-bounded computational depth. So here, s is going to be less than t, and we can define the computational depth on x with time bounds s and t to be the difference of ks of x and kt of x. So informally, if you want to have an intuitive understanding, you can think of it as how much more can you compress the string x if your decompression time bound goes from s up to t? How much more can you squeeze in your compression? Let's give a super quick overview of the Hirahara break, uh, breakthrough framework. So a simpler version of, of some of his main theorems is that if np is not in time 2 to the o of n over log n, then sigma 2p is going to be hard on average. So let's prove this by the contrapositive. So suppose that sigma 2p is going to be easy on average. It turns out, and this is his main result, that this implies that for any language in NP and for sufficiently large T, we have a worst case, or we have an algorithm solving L, and on this input X, the runtime is going to be 2 to the computational depth of X with time bounds T and P of T for some polynomial P of T, and in time some polynomial in T as well overhead. Okay, great. But what do we know about this quantity, this computational depth that's in the exponent here? And when is it small? You know, can we choose a, a nice value of t for which this computational depth is small? And if so, then we have a fast algorithm that solves L, which is great. But how do we find such a t? The point is we'll argue that for some value of t it'll be small. And we're going to try many of the t in parallel and see whichever one gives us the results. And as soon as one of them does, we finish and output that. And how do we argue that for some value of t, this computational depth is small? First, I'll define this iterated polynomial with itself. So remember, p of t is a polynomial. And so p raised to the i of t, so iterated with itself i times. It's just going to be p of p of p of p of t, where you do that i times. And now consider the following sum. So let's just look at the left-hand side. So we're summing here over tau terms, where tau is a parameter I haven't set yet. And what we're summing is the computational depth. First, you know, the first term is going to be the computational depth of time t and p of t of x. Then we sum the computational depth of p of t and p of p of t on x, and so on up to tau terms all the way up. And the key point is that this sum indeed telescopes. You know, the second and the third term here are going to cancel. And uh, the fourth and the fifth will cancel as well. And all the terms will cancel, leaving just the first and the last terms, which you can interpret as a computational depth itself. And the point is that since this is just the difference of two kt complexities, this is going to be at most n plus big O of 1. 
So just to recap, this big sum is going to be at most n plus big O of 1. And so by an averaging argument, one of these terms must be at most n over tau plus big O of 1. OK, great. So what does this give us in terms of a runtime for our algorithm? So say, say our polynomial p of t is a polynomial t to the c. So c is just some constant, let's say bigger than 1. And so if we start off with our initial time, t being polynomial in n, and if you unfold the runtime we get from the main lemma from Hirahara, this turns out to be t to the, 2 to the n over tau, where this n over tau corresponds to the computational depth of this optimally chosen t. And then times your, you know, your poly t overhead, and at worst case, that's going to be p raised, iterated with itself tau times on our initial t. And this gives you 2 to the n over tau times n to the o of c to the tau, because we iterate this polynomial with itself tau times. And just to recap, you know, this is our runtime for an algorithm that we solve L on any input now x. And so what's the last thing we have to do? We just have to balance. To balance these terms, you end up setting tau to be proportional to log, in, log of n. And for sufficiently small constant epsilon, the runtime becomes 2 to the O of n over log n. And this is the main sketch of, of uh, the work of Yurohara, skipping many, many steps. But the point is now we've solved a problem L in NP in time 2 to the O of n over log n, as desired. Great. So what if we wanted to improve these results? If we wanted to go beyond 2 to the O of n over log n, how could we do better? The main point is that this iterated polynomial with itself, if you do it tau times, this growth in tau is extremely fast. It's in some sense doubly exponential in tau. And that means you can't really do better than setting tau to be logarithmic in n. Otherwise, it'll be too big. So for the moment, let's suspend reality and assume that the polynomial p of t is just linear in t instead of a larger degree polynomial. So to be concrete, let's say p of t equals c times t. Then, iterated with itself tau times, this is c to the tau times t. And the point is that this is singly exponential in tau, not doubly exponential. And if you do the math, and if you balance, what we're going to get is 2 to the n over tau. Sorry. If you get 2 to the n over tau times c to the o of tau times polynomial in n. And to balance this, you're going to set t to be root n, proportional to root n, which gives you in the exponent 2 to the o of, or gives you 2 to the o of root n overall. And this is much, much less than 2 to the o of n over log n. So this is a win. And in fact, you know, we can't quite get p of t to be linear, but if you get p of t to be quasi-linear, so t times polylogarithmic in t, then if you just run the same argument back, you'll get 2 to the O of root n log n. So we get an extra root log n factor in the exponent. And this is what we end up getting at the end of the day. So the question is, how do we get p of t to grow slowly? The point is that the main bottleneck, and I'm not going to get into the details here just for time's sake, but the main bottleneck in proving Hirohara's main lemma to get small p of t is derandomization. So to get small p of t, we need very efficient derandomization. And moreover, the, the results used in the, in the Hirohara lemma is that if np is easy on average, then we have a PRG of log n c length that's secure against t time algorithms, but that the PRG itself is computable in poly t time. So in other words, we have a discrepancy between the security, which is only against t-time algorithms, but itself it's computable only in poly of t-time. Is there any way to refine this so that the runtime of the PRG is closer to the runtime of the algorithms we want to fool? And this is one of our main technical contributions. We get extremely efficient derandomization from fine-grained average case easiness of NP. 
So explicitly, if we have this average case easiness of non-deterministic linear time, if it's in quasi-linear average time, then we have a PRG that has log m seed length. It constantly fools all t time and m bit advice distinguishers. And moreover, this PRG is computable in time t times polynomial in m. So think of t here as much larger than m. And if that's the case, we're fooling t time distinguishers. And our computation time is t times polynomial in m, where poly in m is much less than t. So the overhead here in the computation of the PRG is very little. So we have extremely efficient, low overhead way to fool t time computation, but at the do we do have a cost of log of t bits of advice in computing this PRG. And so let me try to give a super high level sketch of how we construct such a PRG. And for the moment, I'm going to imagine a simpler version where we construct a hitting set generator from average case easiness. And I'm not going to define hitting set generator exactly, but it's effectively a PRG where you only try to de-randomize one-sided error algorithms. So you try to hit some set of possible random strings that your algorithm will accept very, very roughly. And the key tool we're going to use is an extractor from Shell, Tiel, and Umans which says roughly that if you have some avoider d, which point one avoids su, some function su of x and random string, then you can convert that uh, distinguisher or this, this avoider and use it in a black box way to reconstruct x for, some, for the appropriately chosen advice alpha. So in other words, there's always going to be an, you know, if you have an avoider D, there's going to be some advice alpha such that if you reconstruct with advice alpha and with avoider D, you can output X. So why is this useful? Well, the corollary is that if we can find some X that has large KT complexity, much, much bigger than the length of the advice alpha, then this SU of X is going to be a hitting set generator. And why is that true? It's true because if not, in other words, if we had some avoider for SU of X, then you can plug in that avoider into your reconstruction algorithm. And with some small advice alpha, you can package that all together to be some compressed short program that's efficient that outputs X. And so that means that the KT of X is going to be small because we've just evidenced a program that runs quickly that outputs X. So we've reduced all of this to just the question of whether we can efficiently find some X that has a large KT of X. And the, once again, the very, very short version of how we do that is a mixture of the time hierarchy theorem and efficient PCPs, probabilistically checkable proofs. So super, super roughly, x will end up being the truth table of some accepting oracle for a PCP of a language that we get out of applying the time hierarchy theorem. And it turns out that if we did have a short efficient program for this truth table, then using our average case easiness assumption, you can convert that ultimately into a deterministic program that solves the language L. But that contradicts the fact that L is hard unconditionally because L is given to us by the time hierarchy theorem. And so that's a very rough sketch of the proof. And that's the end of the technical portion of the talk. Okay, just to summarize and some open questions. First of all, as before, meta complexity remains a really powerful tool to overcome barriers that relate worst, that relate worst case and average case complexity. So our theorem statements didn't have anything to do with meta complexity itself, yet as a tool it ended up being very useful to have meta complexity to relate worst case and average case complexity. Another thing is that if we go to the world of fine-grained complexity, 
This allows us to give a refined connection, a more strengthened and refined connection between worst case and average case complexity. And in this light, maybe you know, fine-grained cryptography is a much more achievable goal. And lastly, unsurprisingly, pseudorandomness can be very useful, can be very powerful. And just to finish with some open questions, is there any barrier to improving this two to the O of root n log n that we get? Uh, you know, maybe some barrier comes up in going beyond that. You know, can we do better? Can we do not? It remains open. And similarly, can we try to exclude fine-grained pesky land or have some evidence to exclude fine-grained pesky land instead of just uh, fine-grained heuristica? All right, thanks so much.